as I said, this is the skills for bees Cymru section one with Claire Flynn. So I'll be giving you a quick overview of Covnod and what we're about. And then I'll hand you over to the capable hands of Claire who will tell us all about bumblebees because that's what we're here for actually. <laughs> okay, so here's an outline. I'll obviously reiterate what I've just said there. Uh, and there's a picture of something that looks like a bumblebee, but hopefully by the end of the course, we'll know whether it is or not. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. So what is Covenant? Well, I'm sure a few of you are already familiar with us, but we're essentially part of a consortium of four biological record centres across Wales. So we sort of come under this loose umbrella of LERC Wales, Local Environmental Record Centres Wales. Uh, we're, we're all actually independent entities, sort of not-for-profit charity, uh, not-for-profit companies. So that's how we work. But we are, we operate as a nice group. So these courses that Claire's giving through the trust, she's giving them in all the all the uh, LERCs across Wales. So we're lucky to have them in North Wales as well too. So what's nice about the consortium is that we've been able to develop things that are common across Wales. So it's a nice total system, really. So one of these is this LERC Wales app. So if any of you are into recording using your mobile phone, this is a fantastic resource to use. It's free. You can just download it from the App Store, Google Play. Very easy to use. Uh, very intuitive. We'll talk more about this in session two uh, later, so I won't labour this point. Just to make you aware it exists, you may wish, wish to download it, have a play before the next session. Uh, it's fully bilingual, so you can use it in both English and Welsh. Uh, great resource, easy to use. So, Covenod, well, we hold almost four and a half million records across all species. In the North Wales region. So that's quite a significant holding of records, I think, and it's growing all the time and increasing probably exponentially as the popularity of recording has increased. We've, we've definitely noticed that, and particularly during lockdown, there's you know, a big spike in people's engagement with wildlife and wanting to record what they see. So we're there to help, really. Uh, we do a lot of public engagement things. So to be honest with you, most of our work tends to go through Twitter. So we're very active on Twitter, but we do have a presence on the likes of Instagram, Facebook. Our YouTube channel is getting increasingly popular now. We're, all our courses that we run are recorded and placed on the YouTube channel there. We've got playlists for simple how to record sessions or more in depth courses like macro photography, lots of skills things. So. There's a course on there for, that will appeal to everybody, I believe. So please check that out. So as I said, this course will eventually go on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to review it and refresh your mind before the next session. Uh, and what we do in real, real non-COVID times, we're often quite public outreachy. So we'll have our attend bio blitzers organized by other company, uh, other partners, say a local university, wildlife trust, the likes. And we'll just be there to help support the collation of the data that comes in. We'll be there with our laptops, logging all the data as it comes in live. And we can display that on the day to people that are attending the event. Uh, we also have these recorders days. And these are for more experienced recorders who we don't necessarily want to have a guided tour of species that they just want to go to an interesting bit of habitat, maybe a place where there's no public access usually. We'll help change that with the landowner and they'll be able to go off and record to the heart's content and get a nice species list for an interesting site. So there we are in a fantastic raised bog habitat down in Mary Honestia. Uh, I think many of you that I've seen on the course today uh, have attended some of our in-person courses. So Treborth at Bangor there, wonderful resource, fantastic lab space. And yeah, 
microscopes on hand there for people to use. We'll get experts in to lead these courses. Uh, obviously, these, these sort of talk courses have been migrated online since COVID, but we're hoping to introduce them later in the year. So watch our website and hopefully we'll have some good news. Certainly recorders, days and bio blitz as we're starting to plan them for this year. So touch wood, we'll be able to see you in person rather than virtually. And then there's our annual conference. So that's a very, always a very popular event where people from across North Wales a mass and listen to a range of lectures, hear about what Kovanov's been doing in the year and generally chew the fat with each other. So it's a great place to meet other recorders, see people that you haven't met for a long time. And I think that's what most people use it for. It's, and there's even a free lunch as well. Let's say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, there is at the Kovanov conference. So uh, that one in mind. Right, so I'm just going to take you through the very basics of what a record is for those who aren't familiar with it. I'm sure many of you are, so apologies for going very basic, but let's start. Richard, from the Richard. Yeah. sorry, we're just, we're just losing sound a little bit. I don't know if it's... All right, it could be my broadband. Okay, it's okay, but it's, it, I just wondered if your microphone needed, it's just dipping out a little bit. Yeah, it should be all right. Okay, how's that? Is that all right now? Yeah, that sounds okay. Great. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Claire. No problem. Okay, so what is a record? Well, what we tend to say is it's four W's. So what, uh, essentially the name of the thing that you've just seen. So you can use a common name to enter a record. So Bufftail Bumblebee or the scientific name Bombus terrestris. So the other W is aware. So where have you seen it? Uh, generally, you might use a town name, uh, a location name like the Great Orm. Uh, avoid terms like my garden or G Jim's house or something like that because it's meaningless if somebody sees your record later in the year. Always nice to have a grid reference so you can. Grab that from a mobile phone app or a GPS if you have one. Or you can even pick it from a map on the Covenant website. And then when did you see it? That's important as well. So the seasonality of a species can give the verifier a lot of confidence in your record. So best to be as accurate as possible. So maybe a day, month and a year. If you only know the season, say you're working through a museum collection, you may only know the year. So just put the best you can. It's better to have a date rather than no date. And then the who, uh, that's obviously the recorder. So it'll either be your name or if you've heard of the record secondhand, put their name down. If you don't know the person, just put an on. But don't put terms like me, because very much like my garden. It's a meaningless thing in a record for somebody who doesn't know you. So what do we record? Well, people have got different reasons for recording. So I think most of us re record for personal interest. It's, it's nice to see things that you haven't seen before and make a list of what you've seen and then you can go over those records and appreciate where you've been. And the nice thing is that a lot of these records have a use for conservation as well. So records that come to us, you may store them for personal interest, but they become useful for other people like conservationists, reserve managers, etc. And then you can feed them into national data sets which produce species atlases. So we know the distribution across Britain. So it's very much a sort of collaborative thing. So you're, you're helping at the national scale by working locally. And then there's planning decisions. So plat, uh, local county ecologists will have access to your data through Covnod. And that way they can make useful decisions about planning. So if you've seen something interesting, let us know. You don't want to be in a position where an interesting species has got bulldozed, for instance, because the local council didn't know it was even there. At least if the record, county ecologists will have an idea it's there. 
and then they can take that into account in any decision making. And of course, these things feed into national status reports, or a state of nature report that comes out periodically. Without those biological records at the bottom of this pyramid, a state of nature report will not have data to work on. So please bear that in mind. Although you're doing it for personal interest, it has many other benefits there. Uh, what do you want to record? Well, I'd say everything pretty much. You, you never know if a species will be rare in the future or if it'll suddenly explode and become common. So we saw that with the tree bumblebee I know, 10 years ago, quite unusual. Now, pretty ubiquitous, but Claire will explain more, I'm sure. And rarities are always interesting, but common things are just as interesting. So do record them. Don't, don't forget to do that. And to get those long term trends, you really need good data every year. So don't just say, oh, I've, I've recorded it five years ago. I'm not going to bother recording it this year. Send that record in and then we've got continuity of. I did say record everything, but yeah, maybe hourly records of the same species at the same place could be a bit extreme. So, yeah, use your common sense. Just. Maybe if you see in bumble, a bumblebee species every day of the year, you may just want to put a record every so often, maybe once a week or thereabouts. Right. So you've made your record and you want to know a bit more about it. Well, thankfully we've got this Adairian species, all the whale, whales LERC records in one place. So you can go on that website and type in a species name and you'll get maps. So you can either use it through this section, just telling you what's in your 1km square and generate a nice species list. It won't tell you sensitive species like badgers for obvious reasons. But you might also want to just look at one species and see, is it rare across whales or have I found something really common that I didn't realize it was so common. So have a look at that. And you use these species drill down, so you have to know a little bit about the sort of taxonomic hierarchy of your, your species you're interested in. So in this case, if we were working with bumblebees, you'd want to select invertebrates insect, uh, insect hymenopteran. So if you're a total beginner, it wouldn't be obvious that you'd get it through there, but just use those terms and then start typing the species. You can either use a an English common name or a scientific name, and then it will return a WYSI map. So there we go. It's selected that species name just from buff, and it's giving you a few options and you click on it. Click that green arrow, and then it will take you to a nice map, giving you a, a nice overview across Wales. And you can see where it is, where the most records are, where there's gaps that you might want to go and look for things to fill in record gaps in Wales. So I think that's me finished really. So that's just a very basic overview of Covnod, uh, what a record is and what to do. So I'm now going to hand you over to Claire who will give you a lot more details about bumblebees, which is what we're all here for, of course. So a bit of etiquette, just keep your mics on mute while Claire's talking and we can open the mics to a open mic session later if required for questions and what have you. Okay, so I'll hand you over to Claire and go on silent. Okay, can you see my screen, Richard? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah. Great stuff, okay. Okay, well, thanks, Richard. That's, that's great and thanks for uh, letting me uh, join the Cofnod um, sort of selection of courses for this year. I'm uh, really excited because I'm working with all four LERCs and uh, I've worked quite a bit with um, my regional LERC for the last 10 years, WWBIC. So it's really nice building up this partnership now for my project, which is Skills for Bees Cymru being uh, delivered by the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And basically th this project, it's, it's three years, it's, it's funded by a charitable uh, foundation. And the whole rationale is to increase 
um, our data holdings for bumblebees across Wales because we've got a lot of gaps in the data, both in terms of species gaps of things that have not been recorded for a long time, uh, and even a lot of our common things are un quite under recorded. Uh, so in a lot of squares across Wales, um, even 10k squares, we've got very, very few records of even the commonest species. And um, also we want to train volunteers uh, like yourselves to improve their ID skills and submit data. Um, so yeah, both the species and geographical gaps, we really, really want to fill them. And, you know, Richard's right that that data has so many applications, which is vital for conservation. And, and um, you know, we hope that this project will sort of act as a template, actually, for the, for the rest of the UK. Um, our fingers crossed if things go well. So, yeah, I've, I've worked for the Trust um, on and off uh, for about the last four years with a little bit of working for plant life in between. So my interests are uh, mostly invertebrates and bees and um, wildflowers. So this is um, a really, really uh, kind of bit of a dream job for me, really. Um, so this session uh, is going to be very much a beginner's session. And I am I'm going to apologise now if you do have, uh, you know, previous knowledge of bumblebees. Um, we are going to go right back to the beginning. I'm kind of assuming no knowledge so that we can address everybody's uh, starting point and make sure that, um, you know, we're bringing up everyone to the same level from, from the very beginning. And um, before tea, we'll have just a little bit about bees in general um, and bumblebees. And then after break, we'll have a look at the queens of the big eight. And then next week, we'll look in more detail at the big eight and uh, gain a little bit of awareness about the cuckoo bees as well. OK, so we shall make a start. So in the UK, we have approaching 280 species of bee. Uh, it varies around that 275 number, mostly due to the solitary bees, because in some years we might uh, gain a new species. Thank you to, you know, thanks to voluntary recorders who occasionally turn up uh, a species new to the UK list. And um, we have periodically lost species as well. So an approximate number. And if we start with the honeybees, we have one species in the UK, Apis mellifera. And the solitary bees, they make up the bulk of our bee diversity, if you like, both in the UK and the world. We've got about 245 species in the UK, very, very diverse um, sort of forms and life histories. So very diverse and incredibly important pollinator group and completely fascinating. And we have the bumblebees, which of course uh, we're going to be focusing on. And we have currently 24 species in the UK. Uh, there, you might see bandied about the number 25 because we did try and reintroduce the short-haired bumblebee in Kent, but we're not quite sure if that introduction has been successful. So, um, yeah, at the moment, we're keeping that total at 24. OK, so a little bit of comparison between the three groups. Uh, bees in, as a group evolved from um, certain uh, families of wasps back around the time that flowering plants had just evolved and pollen became available as the very protein rich uh, food source, probably about 100 million years ago, take, give or take a few million years. I think there is um, evidence of bees in the fossil record about 80 million years ago. 
but essentially some wasps started to gather pollen to feed to their young rather than um, collecting killing prey and these bees these wasps became uh, vegetarian and essentially that was the evolution of our, our bees so they're very closely related to wasps as I am sure you already know so all bees are vegetarian um, and honeybees, uh, as I said, this one species, they are highly social insects, they have complex social behaviour. Please don't ask me any questions on honeybees because um, I don't know much about honeybees at all. Um, from an ecological viewpoint, um, they're considered as a, as a domesticated insect, although obviously there are some feral colonies. Um, these guys are the ones that are responsible for the um, thing that I'm always asked, do bees die when they sting? Honeybees tend to die because their sting is barbed and it gets stuck in people's skin. As they pull away, as the bee pulls away, she gets uh, sort of damaged and uh, usually fatal. So honeybees are corbiculate, meaning that they have an adapted hind leg to carry their pollen load. And even on this tiny picture, you can see the beginning of a little white pollen load there at the base of a um, femur on her hind leg. Um, so yeah, the, the, the common name for that is pollen baskets. And the thing about honeybees is that because they make honey so fantastically, uh, the colony can um, survive the winter by eating those honey stores. So um, that gives them um, a great uh, adaptation and advantage in a, in a temperate climate. So that's honeybees. And then bumblebees, I, 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 you can think of it almost as an evolutionary sort of um, spectrum here. So they're similar to honeybees in several ways. Vegetarian, as we've said, 24 species here. There's about 250 species in the world. Um, they are all so social insects. So they have a cast with a queen and her daughter workers and the males, which we don't tend to call drones with bumblebees. I don't, I don't know why that is actually, um, but we just tend to call them males. And then the queens and the workers. They are, all the species we have are native to the UK and mostly wild, but we do have some imported colonies um, from the Netherlands. There's a big factory, I think it's Netherlands or Belgium, uh, where they produce commercial Bombus terrestris bufftail nests, which are used for pollination in things like uh, greenhouse crops. So we do have those imported, which has a lot of issues around it. Uh, bumblebees have a smooth sting, which I know um, because I've been stung <laughs> and she flew off quite happily to go and sting again uh, while they were in pain. And like honeybees, they are corbiculate, so she has a modified hind leg to carry her pollen load. But unlike honeybees, they don't make honey in any real sense. Uh, they do sort of uh, make a liquidy stuff out of nectar in the nest and they mix it with pollen to feed their young, but they don't make honey or store it. And so to survive our temperate winters, the whole colony dies every year and the only survivors are the new uh, daughter queens, which we'll come to in a minute, and they hibernate alone. So quite a key ecological difference there with honeybees. And then solitary bees, um, because they're such a diverse group, we're only talking in sort of general terms here in this little simple table. Uh, and I've already covered the first two points. But the key difference here compared to the honeybees and bumblebees is almost all solitary bees, as their name suggests, are not social insects. So almost all of them um, the female uh, is mates and immediately works alone to build a nest. She provisions each of her eggs, seals them up. There's no more parental care, whereas in the other two groups, there is a lot of um, parental and worker 
here, I have to say, in the colony. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she keeps going basically until, until she dies in the same season. There are a few species that show the beginnings of social behaviour with varying degrees of caste differentiation, but they, they are in the vast minority. Um, our solitary bees are wild, though there is some purchasing of things like red mason bees to pollinate orchards. So there, there are some commercially available, but not to the extent of bumblebee um, production, if you like. Smooth sting, often so small in some of the solitary bees, it wouldn't hurt you anyway, but all the females have a sting, as in the other two groups. They don't have um, modified hind legs in the sense of having the clear, de clearly defined pollen basket, uh, but they do have special pollen carrying hairs called scopa. So that's another difference. And another key difference is that uh, Adults don't overwinter, they will die off, and the young overwinter in the nest um, before their final adult molt. It does vary slightly from species to species, but um, by and large, that is their key strategy. Okay, so a few simple sort of comparisons between those major groups. And um, I'll just whisk through these because um, I'm sure you all know that. Um, please excuse me, I'm just another little drink. Bees are key pollinators out of uh, many other groups of insects because we do hear it harped on about how wonderful bees are, and they are wonderful. They're not the only pollinators, but um, they are responsible for a huge um, portion of our pollination, both of uh, agricultural crops and food crops and um, wildflowers and garden flowers. And bumblebees in particular are particularly effective for lots of different reasons. Um, they have um, across our species, they have many different tongues, so they're able to access many different types of flower, as opposed to, for example, honeybee workers, which have a fairly uniform tongue length um, and only being one species, there isn't the same variety. Um, and also bumblebees can carry out buzz pollination where they actually knock, uh, use, vibrate their wing muscles to knock pollen off anthers in certain flowers. Uh, you can see them doing that in comfrey sometimes. Uh, they are key to pollinating tomatoes. They use po buzz pollination for tomatoes. Um, and I know that uh, in Australia, they've not been allowed to import bumblebees because they don't have them naturally and uh, they have to hand pollinate uh, their tomato crops for their barbecues. But in New Zealand, because a lot of colonisers took them over, took queen bumblebees over over 100 years ago, put, uh, New Zealand is overrun with um, our British <laughs> uh, bumblebees. Um, and they've actually caused havoc in their plant pollinator interactions over there. So even though it's great because they, they can use them in farming, uh, not so great for their native wildflowers and pollinators. So yeah, very important and that's part, one of the reasons I think these have such a high profile in conservation at the moment. And again, you know, if people see me out and about with my net, they often ask me what I'm doing. They either suggest, think I might be fishing, which I'm obviously not, because <laughs> I'm rarely near water. Um, uh, or think I'm catching butterflies. And when I tell them about bees, almost everyone says to me, you know, bees are in trouble. And yes, the overall picture is that they are, which we'll look at in a bit more detail on the next slide. And despite a lot of sort of high profile things in the media, the, the single biggest um, cause of our current declines is habitat loss. It's the change in farming methods across Europe um, after the Second World War, which went from, you know, it's, it's the same story, isn't it, for so much wildlife. We went from smaller farms, um, making hay, having flower-rich grasslands, to silage, 
and uh, the loss of herbal lays and clover lays and all of those sorts of things, the loss of hedgerows, all of that just decimated our bee populations. And I am going to change this slide because um, this shows a huge arable field, which isn't relevant so much to us in Wales, but certainly down with me in Pembrokeshire, you know, we're a massively um, uh, sort of well-known county for, for dairy farming. And um, I am surrounded in my village by silage and now I'm surrounded by indoor dairy farms um, and very, very intensely farmed uh, fields indeed. So we've gone even a step further <laughs> into loss at the moment, but um, that uniformity across our landscape has been a disaster really for bumblebees as it has for so many other species. So I do think things are looking up. I, I do think there are good times ahead. So we don't want to be too negative. Um, so 1980 was the first real kind of um, sort of evidence-based report of, of how things had gone from 1900, where naturalists had been recording doing exactly what Richard has just described. Um, in back, back in those days, it was often quite well-to-do middle-class men with a bit of time on their hands who um, were very, very keen naturalists. And they provided us with lots and lots of early records for um, our British wildlife, including bumblebees. But the 1980 Atlas showed, looking at all of those records, that of our social bumblebees, which I will pick up on in a sec, um, seven species have declined by more than 70% in their distribution, um, in their range between 1900 and 1980. So, you know, huge losses um, across the UK and, and very similar picture in Wales. Two species went extinct in the latter half of the 20th century. Um, and in Wales, we currently have five species on our section seven list, which is our list of conservation concern. The shrill cardigan, which uh, only has five very isolated populations left in the UK. And we're lucky enough to have three of those in Wales uh, on the south coast, south of the M4, one in Gwent on the levels, a very, very um, unmonitored and possibly um, very reduced population around Kenvig National Nature Reserve near Bridge End and uh, in Pembrokeshire, uh, where I live on the Castle Martin Peninsula, which is a, a relic of species rich grassland owned by the MOD. And it, it only remains so really because um, it's still a very active MOD training site. And it is, it's incredible, it, it's really amazing. And I've seen Silvara in there on several occasions, but um, yeah, on, on the brink of extinction, really, uh, that, that species. So we've got um, a conservation strategy just beginning on that to try and improve the chances of saving it. And then we've got the brown banded cardiby, Bombus humilis, the moss cardiby, Bombus muscorum, the red champ cardiby, Bombus ruderarius, and the rudral bumblebee, bumblebee, Bombus ruderatus. Um, I've never seen the red chunk card be or the rudral bumblebee in Wales, and part of my project will be to look out for those species. Um, and many of these species in North Wales are really under recorded. So I'm really hoping you know we can progress to do some courses with Cothnod on some of these rarer species and um, do some rare species days to see because we could have populations of these things in North Wales that we just don't know about. And, um, the, you know, this is the rationale for this project, really. We, we need more data, but we need it on the common stuff as well, not, not just the rare things. So the Bumblebee Conservation Trust was set up, um, um, I think it was 2008. And 
It was set up by Professor Dave Goulson, who was an academic in Stirling, Scotland at the time. And he is very much an academic, but also a very, very um, proactive conservationist. And he was fed up of just being an academic. He wanted to do more grassroots conservation. And so he founded the Trust. Uh, he isn't part of the Trust anymore, but he is a friend of the Trust still. And because of that legacy, we are very much an organisation that is based in science and research. So whatever we do um, is, is, is rooted in scientific evidence. And then we filter that down to all of the work we do with communities and landowners and all of those things you can see on that slide. So we have a very diverse sort of set of outputs. Um, I'm in the science team and my project is part of uh, this, the, the science core of the trust. Okay, so on to bumblebees a little bit more now before we um, have, have a break. Like I said, I do apologise because I'm very aware that some of you are very experienced recorders and you know, pro probably very much into your insects, some of you. So this is very basic stuff. But um, when I when I do talks, you know, people respond so positively to bumblebees. They're a very engaging group of little insects and they are very, very cute. <laughs> it's, uh, I never lose that, even though I'm in the science team, they are absolutely delightful to watch. They're fascinating. They're very charismatic, even though they don't know it. So, um, yeah, we get lots of things uh, aimed at us, you know, they're buzzy and they're fuzzy and they're very noticeable in your gardens. Um, critically, they're great pollinators and people, children know that as well as adults. But uh, looking a bit more scientifically, and like Richard uh, mentioned, you know, when you, when you start getting into recording, having an awareness of some of the more uh, scientific terms around classification can help. So they are invertebrates um, because they have no uh, bony internal skeleton, but they have a hard outer case, if you like, an exoskeleton to protect their, their insides. Um, they're arthropods and within that they are typical insects. So they have a body in three parts, which I'll show you in a minute. <clears throat> And they have, insects have one of two life cycles and the bumblebee has one of those where they uh, lay an egg, the egg hatches into a little maggoty grub, a larvae, uh, equivalent of a caterpillar. And uh, the caterpillar feeds up, all that tasty pollen gets fatter and fatter and eventually spins a cocoon and pupates inside the cocoon and undergoes a complete metamorphosis into a beautiful adult bumblebee. Um, and so within the insect group, bumblebees, sawflies, which aren't flies at all, um, ants and wasps are what we call hymenopterans, which literally means membrane winged, because they have two pairs of wings which join together in flight through a set of hooks. Um, and form a complete membrane. Flies only have one pair of wings and they're dipterans, but the bees are hymenopterans, membrane winged. And within that, we have the stinging hymenopterans, the aculeata, and bees, wasps and ants are all in that group. And their sting is modified from um, their ancestors' egg-laying uh, ovipositor, the egg-laying tube from the wasps that they're evolved from, and this um, means that only the females sting. The males don't have the equipment and they don't have the need for it because they don't do any defending of the nest. So um, only female bees sting. And all of our bumblebees in the UK are in the same genus. So very, very closely related, all 24 species and all of their Latin names begin with the generic name of Bumbus. So a little bit more detail on that, um, so, the idea of sociality. So just to confuse slightly what I told you a few minutes ago, we have 24 species, sorry, I keep hitting the menu 
We have 24 species in the UK, but actually of those, only 18 are what we call truly social bumblebees, which means that the nest is uh, started by a queen uh, who lays eggs and produces her daughter workers. So that's two casts within the colony. And at the end of the colony, she lays eggs which turn into males and off they go. So queens, workers and males, all of the same species in one nest. But six of our bumblebees, still the same genus, they're still bumblebees, but they have evolved a slightly different life history, which kind of knocks these rules out of place. And what they've evolved to do is act as cuckoos on their social counterparts. So each cuckoo, each species of cuckoo targets a particular species, social species of bumblebee. And the female cuckoo, there are only males and females, there are no workers, and the females are all uh, quite big. The females will go into the nest of their host bumblebee. They will attack the queen and try and kill her. So there'll be a fight to the death usually, but they might sometimes overcome her and expel her from the nest. And the, the female cuckoo will then take over the nest as her own and lay her own eggs of her own species in the wax cells. Oh, whoops. But she will use the worker daughters of the host to do all of the work and bring up new males and females of the cuckoo. Okay, so um, these are tricksy little, little bumblebees and um, they're fascinating to see. They never, they never threaten the numbers of their host species. They exist in kind of perfect balance. So the cuckoo bumblebees always are more scarce than their host. So, you know, it's that typical nature's balance there. They don't cause any threat to the destruction of those species. Uh, and they are really quite amazing to see. And we'll do a bit more on those next week. So when we are getting into identification, we do use some technical terms very, very, very simply. And I'm sure some of you already know this stuff because it's general to, to all insects. But like I said earlier, they are split into, um, their bodies are split into the head, the thorax in the middle, and then bumblebees, although it's not that visible, they, they have a constricted waist, a bit like a wasp. So it's not quite as constricted, but it is there. And then they have an abdomen. And these correspond, you know, on the body, obviously you've got the head with the antennae and the compound eyes, and then the thorax in the middle and the abdomen uh, goes from the waist to, to the end. And we, when we're talking about um, identification, we talk about tail color. There isn't really a tail, we just mean the last few segments of the ab abdomen because their body is segmented. Um, and then the sting there is obviously where the um, egg laying uh, ovipositor would have been, and two pairs of wings. And underneath all that fuzz, bumblebees are all black. Every single species is black under the uh, um, hair, and we call this the integument. So it is the hair that creates the bands and the colours. And so when they start to lose hair towards the end of the season, that can be a bit of a pain and you will begin to see the integument then shining through. Okay, so I'm going to explain the bumblebee annual life cycle, which is, apart from being just really nice to know because it's fascinating, um, it really helps us when we're recording because it's one of the clues that we can use to narrow things down if we're a bit unsure of a species. And it can also help us to decide um, on cast of have we got a queen, have we got a male or a female, etc. So, with a little sip of water, excuse me. In the early, early spring, depending on species, because there is a um, a temporal variation between the emergence of different species. 
Uh, the queens will have hibernated, as I mentioned, and they will have also mated the previous year. And they carry the sperm inside them in a special sac in their bodies. Um, and they, they don't fertilise their eggs until they want to, until they decide to. So the males are long dead and now completely redundant. And the um, queen is self-sufficient. So she comes out of hibernation. The first thing she needs to do is eat and uh, sustain herself and replenish her resources. And so she will um, look for early pollen and nectar. She will eat pollen to help her ovaries develop and she will drink nectar for energy. And things like willow, if you're keen gardeners, brilliant, brilliant early resource for queen bumbles. And when she's um, nice and sort of healthy again, she will start to look for a nest. And if you have seen big bumblebees zigzagging over the ground, or rustling about in the undergrowth, that will be a queen looking for a suitable nest site. Uh, so it's very typical nesting behaviour that, quite difficult to photograph them when they're, when they're that because they don't stay still. They might investigate holes, go in, shoot back out till they find something they like. And again, that varies with species. Different species have different preferences. So some like to nest under the ground in an old vole nest or a um, little mouse hole. Things like the buff tail will choose that sort of site. Tree bumblebees like to nest in holes in trees and then also use nest boxes um, or the eaves of the house, etc, etc. So lots of different preferences. But once she's done that, she's got it how she likes it. She's quite a bit housekeeping, getting it you know, um, to her liking she will create a ball, a sticky ball of pollen and nectar, which you can see her sitting on there, and she will lay her first batch of eggs into it. I think it's about sort of um, somewhere around sort of 16 eggs, something like that in her first batch, and she will create a little wax pot uh, from wax secreted from her body, and she will um, put that near enough to her that she can reach it and sustain herself while she breeds the eggs. And that is quite incredible um, behaviour, I think. You know, she's actually an insect after all. So it's very, very, very complex and fascinating. And she will leave the nest periodically to get more nectar um, and, uh, you know, maybe get some more pollen. So she will be seen out foraging. You will see queens carrying pollen. Uh, in the springtime. And then the uh, eggs hatch out into larvae, little white grubs, which will eat the pollen and nectar and get nice and fat. And um, after a couple of weeks or so, they will pupate and um, uh, metamorphose then within in the cocoon and emerge as adults, adult workers. So they're all her daughters. They're all sisters and they all work for the good of the colony. So they then take over all the tasks of the colony from their mother. Uh, they collect all the food, they keep things clean, they keep the nest cool, and they will defend the nest against intruders. So in the summer, we see these numbers of workers, of smaller bumblebees building up as the queen lays more and more batches of eggs. And then towards the end of the colony life cycle, and the, the, the length of the colony life cycle also varies from species to species, some are quicker than others, she will start to lay eggs which she hasn't fertilised and they will turn into males. So there's a lot of interest in genetics around bumblebees. They will turn into males, but also some of her fertilised eggs at that point will be fed and tended exceptionally well by her daughters and they will turn into queens. And when the males and the queens uh, emerge as adults, they will leave the nest, the males don't return. The, the new daughter queens may go back for some shelter, etc. But generally they're off into the world and um, looking for each other. And one or two males are successful in finding queens, most of them don't, but uh, they will mate. 
And once the queen has mated, she will immediately start to feed and look for a hibernating place. And that's why late pollen and nectar is so important for our males and our new queens. And a lot of our species that have declined most, like the shrill card, are late emerging species. So when grasslands get cut by the end of July, they're still in their um, sort of full stages of their life cycle. So those sorts of species have suffered a lot, the loss of species rich sort of grasslands. And just to um, sort of give a little bit more detail on each of those kind of the casts that you see at different stages of the life cycle. The queens, as I've said, they are the first to emerge in the spring. And it's a really nice time to start getting your eye in with bumblebees because queens are often fresh and bright. They're bigger, they're easier to see. Uh, and if you can catch them foraging rather than nest searching, so that you can get a good look at them. Uh, then their colours are really clear and their patterns are clear and they haven't had a chance to fade like the workers and males do. They're often quite loud so that you, you are drawn to them uh, and where they are. So um, the queens are really nice to see and you can see her beautiful, beautiful shiny pollen basket there. So the pollen basket is um, that hind leg and it is hairs are on the side stiff hairs on the side sticking out but it's hairless and smooth on the surface the workers um, are often smaller versions of their mothers though there are one or two exceptions to that and they're going to be emerging later workers of some species are out now i've seen workers of the early bumblebee and the garden bumblebee uh, already so, uh, you know, depending on when they've established their nest, that you will begin to see some smaller bumblebees coming out now. They're generally very active because they've got an enormous amount to do. Um, and if, you know, they, they will often be seen carrying pollen, though not always, because sometimes they're nectaring and uh, topping up their own energy. The males, we have sexual dimorphism in bumblebees in that in some species, males are differently coloured and patterned to the females of the same species, which can make ID tricky. Um, they obviously appear later in the year, though males of some of our earliest emerging bumblebees will start to appear from now, um, but others not till sort of July time. They're never seen with pollen because they have no um, adapted hind leg. They can't collect it, although you will see them with pollen on them just that they picked up by accident. They don't do anything with it. They're often seen actually just sat on flowers, sucking nectar without the same sense of urgency that the workers seem to have. So this is kind of just getting your eye in on the behaviour. They're often fluffier and scruffier and they often have quite um, prominent facial hair. And in four of our common species, the facial hair of the males is yellow. So that's a good uh, ID feature. And they have longer antennae. I do, I will go over some of this again. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing there. And um, before we uh, grab a quick cuppa, um, I'll rush to the loo. Um, is there anyone that would like to put a question in the chat or feel free to shout out? I'm re really happy for people to unmute if you want to ask me something. Um, I'll have a look in the chat because there's, there's a couple of things. That's Okay, David, yeah, males and queens have stings too. So I think I answered that. Only the females. The males are completely harmless. Um, same for wasps as well, um, and you can pick the males up and gently hold them in your hand. It's my favourite party trick, um, but I don't recommend it until you're really confident on your ID, obviously. Uh, so yeah, just the females are, are uh, equipped with the weaponry. Yeah, Any, anyone else? Uh, can I ask a question, Claire? Okay. 
Uh, is, it, is it true that the males have an extra antennal segment? Is that why it's longer? Yeah, and yeah I'll, t I'll touch on that um, uh, in the next half. But yes, yeah, so females have um, 12 segments in their antennae and males have 13. So um, when you start getting into solitary bees, you do have to start counting the segments when you uh, start learning. With bumbles, they're big enough. When I come up and we do some field work, I'll show you in the field and most people get it. They key into the, to the difference in appearance of the male's antennae. I didn't for years. <laughs> I really like, what's everyone on about these different shaped antennae? But you can see it. And it's all because of the extra segment. Yeah. And do they make a smell? I think somebody mentioned that. Yeah, I've never smell. done this, I have to admit. So maybe this year, this is a challenge for me that males will emit different smells. And it's to do with finding a queen and marking spots on a route. Um, so yes, and, and uh, some of them apparently smell like cheese and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So that's another thing I'd like to do this summer because I've never actually experienced that male puff of perfume that is described. Yeah. So I'm big old black huge bumblebee like a Darth Vader of bumblebee seen in South of France. Do they ever cross the channel? Okay. Well, we do. We do get um, black, big black bumblebees here sometimes. The ruderal bumblebee, Bombus ruderatus, which is incredibly scarce and on our, on our conservation priorities list. I've never seen Bombus ruderatus. My colleague, um, Be uh, Nikki in Kent, she sees them a lot down at Dungeness and there is a black, all black form of ruderatus that, that that the queens can have an all black form so it may be that the one you're talking about in France could be Bombus ruderatus I'm not sure but in terms of crossing the channel yes for sure you know bumblebee dispersal is a subject of much needed research and I'm not up to date on all the latest uh, papers and scientific research, but the tree bumblebee, for example, has colonized the UK since 2001. And that is all of the evidence suggests that that is a natural colonization from mainland Europe through crossing the channel. And I have just done a load of research. Um, I did uh, some of it, some of my field work up in North Wales, actually, on um, the vernal um, spring bee, Calitis canicularius, which occurs um, at Aberfrau and New Newborough and a few other places up near you. And that, that has crossed the channel in recent years as well. And that's a sm much smaller solitary bee, so yes, Yes, absolutely. And with with climate change, I mean, why are these bees, you know, there's quite a few things that have come in recently and spread from the southeast of England. So they were at the north of their geographical range and now that range is extending. So there's questions to be asked about climate there. OK, David, is that OK? <laughs> um, Yes, that's that's a, that's another David, David Hill. You said cookie bees have one host species, but we have more bumble true true social bumblebee species than cuckoos. Are there some we are missing? Actually, that's a good question. Yes, it is in that um, those other twelve bumblebees do not host cuckoos, as far as we know in the UK. But that is a good question, David, because I'm not sure if on the continent there are more cuckoos, which we may not have got for, for what other reason very often that the water does, you know, even though they can evidently cross it, it, it does cause a barrier for, for, for um, dispersal for lots of things. So 
Um, I will ask some of my colleagues about that, David, and see what our near regions like France and Belgium, if they have more cuckoo species. Just making a note. Yeah, someone's put about Xylocopa. Was that you, Richard? Yeah, I was just wondering that earlier question about a, a huge black bumblebee on the continent. I wonder if that could be that. It's, I've certainly seen them in southern France and they are really impressive. Yeah. So, it, um, I, yeah, if it, not if it's a bumblebee, obviously. If it's definitely a bumblebee, then. But yeah, there are some really big solitary bees, aren't there? Carpenter bees in, on the continent as well. So, yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know quite, quite what that one is referring to. Yeah, I, th I think there, there's one or two actually established in southern Britain at the moment. Uh, yeah. Watching yeah. Them. They but definitely thinking... have a much more diverse fauna in the southeast of England than, than the rest of the UK. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Are the five species of conservation concern specialists of rare or declining habitat? Um, Yes and no. Um, so different studies have shown different things on this, David. So we, by and large, those species tend to be species of flower rich grasslands. That's quite a general statement because there are differences in their preferences within that. So they have not adapted to more um, urban habitats, if you like, and adapted to our current agricultural landscape. So the species that have remained more ubiquitous are common across our urban landscapes and still persist within our impoverished agricultural landscapes. So like the eight species we're going to talk about today, they, they've made that transition. And in fact, within our towns and cities, you know, there is a paper showing that pollinators, that some of our towns and cities have more pollinator diversity than a lot of our countryside areas because of the species that have been able to adapt. And those section seven ones evidently haven't. They there's also issues around things like so they're a time of emergence so some of those tend to be later emerging species and so they think that current agricultural practices have had a massive impact on those late emerging species because by the time they come out now without herbal lays and clover leaves there is nothing for them to eat they are also for example the, the rare carders so moss carder brown banded and shrill are all grassland nesters. So they, they build their nests in tussocky grass on the surface of the ground, rather than perhaps along the edges of hedgerows um, or, or garden habitats. It's just not going to suit them. So their nesting preference is definitely an issue as well. And we have got indications that other species that aren't on the section seven list, such as the bilberry bumblebee, which I'm very keen to come up and um, work with all of you to see if we can increase the records in North, North Wales. Um, the bilberry bumblebee, which is, as you, the name suggests, you know, the queens particularly are quite specialist on flowering bilberry. Uh, that isn't on the section seven list, but it's thought to be declining, thought to be declining, but we just don't know, really. We haven't got enough data. So, yes, is, is the answer, David. They are more specialists. They failed, if you like, to adapt. But I think the reasons are complex. And so they are longer tongued species as well, which then affects what they can forage on. But one of our other, our longest tongue species, the garden bumblebee, is doing really well. 
So it's not, you know, a definitive answer. So yeah, lo lots of research on that and lots of research needed. Right. So if you, <coughs> excuse me, my voice has gone up. If you are a complete beginner, um, it, uh, it's, it, I feel it's almost like learning to drive. There's like a key sequence of things you really need to go through uh, before you get to identifying the species. As you can become more experienced, you don't have to think about any of this because you'll just know it. But the key questions that I think in your little bumblebee triage is or are, first of all, have you got a bee or is it some other type of insect? because, um, you know, sometimes it isn't a bee. If it is a bee, are you sure it's a bumblebee and not a honeybee or a solitary bee? Not that I want to exclude those from your recording, but we're focusing on bumblebees, obviously. Can you identify it in terms of sex? Um, can you tell if you've got a cuckoo, which is reasonably unlikely but certainly possible because they do crop up and when you're fairly certain of you've got a male cuckoo or a female social and it's a queen or whatever you've got can you then go to species and sometimes you can't okay uh, because the bee is faded or it, it's one of the really difficult ones to distinguish like the carders so you can't always do it to species and don't worry if, if you don't get an answer. But we'll go back now to the first question. And um, if you are a bit more experienced, if you uh, hold back on this one, but I took these species on Pembrokeshire's little bit of upland on the Priscelli Hills last May when the Cotoniasta was in flower and these insects were uh, feeding on the Cotoniaster side by side, but which one is the bumblebee? And, and pop that in the chat or just do it in your head. Uh, if you're quite experienced, just hold back a few seconds to give everyone a chance to think. But which of those two insects is the bumblebee? Um, I can't see the chat, Richard, actually. Oh, there it is. Oh no, I can't see the chat. Is there anything in the chat, Richard? Hello? I think Richard's gone. There are a couple, oh. of, a couple of A's and a B. Okay, thank you, David. Brilliant. Just stay with me while Richard's gone in case I have any issues. Um, it's a couple of A's and a B. Okay, right. So the bumblebee is actually B. All right. Um, now, A is a hoverfly. It is a phenomenally good bumblebee mimic. I mean, it's so good. It's mind boggling, really. I just love, love it completely. And um, I think it, I think this one is Volucella bombalans. Somebody might correct me on that one in a bit. Uh, but the bee is, is the bumblebee. And I'm going to explain a little bit more why. So in this picture, again, we've got the bumblebee this time on the left going into feed and the hoverfly in this one is on the right and another phenomenally wonderful uh, mimic of a bumblebee. So uh, we need to eliminate these without when we're out in the fields and it's very easy to do a double take when you see them or begin to try identifying them and really my advice uh, is to look at the head. They are distinctly different when you get your eye in so the fly head, uh, the compound eyes uh, nearly meet in the middle and take up almost the whole of the head with a small gap uh, at the top. 
and the antennae in the field appear very small and insignificant, almost hair-like. Whereas with bumblebees, uh, the eyes, they have compound eyes as well, but the eyes very lateral. They, they, they are always on the side of the head in every single species with a big gap in the middle and the antennae are longer and much more substantial. So if we go back to A and B, the hoverfly on the left, if you see, has these great big compound eyes, very, very fine, centrally placed antennae. And the bumblebee, eyes on the side, and the antennae do come from the middle, but they elbow out and droop, and they're nice, quite, you know, quite thick and chunky. So the other thing is, um, bumblebees actually have two pairs of wings, and flies only have one, but that's quite tricky to see in the field. Um, focus on the heads, um, and you will you will get your eye in on that. So hoverflies are tricksy. And solitary bees can be slightly problematic in distinguishing from bumbles. In this case, the bumblebee is A. Okay, and B, C, and D are all solitary bees. Many solitary bees are very small and almost ant like. This is a male mining bee from the genus Andrina. This one. And this one is um, the hairy footed flower bee, which is very, very round and black and fuzzy, very similar to a bumblebee. Uh, the females have these orange haired back legs and there's no bumblebee with that colour pattern. And the males are sort of beigey coloured. So, but the males have a uh, yellow integument on their faces. So, which I will, I will show you that next week, actually, because that's a good one to show you the male of those. So, um, and this is um, one of the Osmia bees. So quite different and relative, almost easier to distinguish from a bumblebee than some of the hoverflies are, I think, because the solitary bees do, do really look quite different and are generally smaller. So males and females, I'm repeating myself a little bit here, so I won't dwell. These are both uh, photographs that I've taken in the last couple of years down in South Wales. These are the males. This is a male heath bumblebee and a male brown banded carder. Males tend to be quite fluffy and scruffy, but it can vary a little bit with species. They just appear more sort of shaggy somehow. In four of our common species, they have yellow facial hair. They don't have an adapted back leg, which we'll look at in more detail in a minute. So their legs are spindly and the surfaces are all hairy. They don't have that smooth palate pollen basket section. They have longer droopier antennae. And as Richard said, they've got an extra segment, which is what causes the, the difference. They are never seen carrying pollen and they have lazier behaviour. The females in contrast uh, tend to be neater, though that does vary a bit with species. As I said, this is a buff tail. You can see she's almost quite velvety with a very neat pile. They have their shiny hind leg there. You can see it's almost like a mirror with no hairs on it where they gather their pollen. They pretty much always have black faces. There's a bilby bumblebee, does have a tiny, tiny little bit of yellow sometimes on their face, but it's, it's nothing like the um, males have, which is quite distinctive. And then they carry pollen. And you can see her shorter, sort of more V-shaped, sort of rigid antennae than the male's droopy, droopy antennae. And this is a big buff tail queen with huge pollen baskets. Um, and you can just about see her little antenna there. Right, I'm going to whiz through this because we're going to do this a little bit more next week. But it's just to build awareness while you're out looking for bumblebees this week, hopefully, if the weather gets better. Um, our six cuckoo species, and these are all generalisations, but they 
like I said, they only have males and females, so we don't differentiate by calling them females queens. But generally, the females are quite big because they are fighters and they need to overcome the social bumblebee queen. Some species have dark and smoky wings, which are quite distinctive. So if you see with a bee and you think, oh my goodness, those wings look really dark, you might start thinking this could, this could be a cuckoo. So it's like a clue. They don't have pollen baskets in males or females. So you can see her hind legs don't have that lovely glint, that shine glint. They can appear quite bald. They don't have as much hair as our um, social species, which I, I wonder is like, is that an adaptation because they don't need to collect pollen, so they're losing their hair a bit. Uh, I'm not, not quite sure, but they are they are sparse, more sparsely haired. Sometimes when you see them, and this comes with experience, you'll begin to notice that their movement is tends to be slower. When they land on a flower, the, the females especially, they can be very lumbering as they crawl over the top of the flower. They don't seem to be in a rush like the social bumblebees are. Uh, because they're not, you know, they're not feeding young or setting up a nest or any of those things. And they're relatively short tongued, so you can often see them on things like bramble and dandelion where they can access the nectar quite easily. So that, again, is, that's ge a general comment. So once we um, are fairly sure we've got, got a bumble, and this is so, uh, my local national park, some of my uh, friends um, at Pembrokeshire Coast National Park doing some bumblebee training a couple of years ago. When we got our bumble, we need to start thinking about what it might be. Can we identify it? And we use a sort of suite of clues, if you like, to give us our, um, well, hopefully give us an ID. The Bumblebee Conservation Trust very much leads on tail colour. So they categorise species initially by tail colour. So we're going to work with that mostly. And it does help to sort of narrow it down. You know, if it's got a red tail, it can only be this or this, you know, that type of thing. Then we look at banding. So those are the really, really two sort of key features. And then the other things I've already mentioned are additional to that to help us get to cast. Um, And, and in some cases uh, will help us uh, drill down to species as well. And behaviour, as I've already said, this is something to, to, to learn with as you go along. And seasonality, probably I should put in that bracket as well. What time of year it is, you know, if it's March, is this likely to be a male? Well, no, it's not, because they're, they're not going to be out in March. You know, those sorts of clues. And, um, I'm definitely going to change this slide, I've decided, because um, I didn't have a chance to do it for today. But this slide tells us that size isn't very useful for bumblebees, and it's not in some respects. There is size differentiation between species. So, for example, the early bumblebee is generally a smaller species than the buff tail bumblebee. Uh, but there is variation within species. So queens tend to be the biggest, as you'd expect, and the ones that survive tend to be um, quite big, you know, up to two and a half centimetres long. The workers and the males will vary between species, but also within a colony, and that's what makes it hard and confusing. So the males are slightly more consistent, but the workers, because they're produced at different times through the colony cycle, some of them, like especially the first batch, because they've only been fed by their mother, and maybe she's not done a brilliant job of creating her little pollen ball, they might actually be really tiny. And then as the colony grows and you get more workers bringing in more food, 
subsequent larval batches might produce bigger workers. So size can vary with nutrition, but there is a size differentiation we can talk about between species, and I will, I will mention it. So going into some of those um, key features just before we go into the species, with tail colour, we don't just look at the actual colour, but also the extent of the colour to help us with identification. So for example, all of these species we would describe as having red tails, but the red tail is quite different in appearance. So in the early bumblebee, it's just the sort of final segment that's uh, orangey red, right at the tip of its abdomen. In the red tail bumblebee and two other species actually that are similar, the red is much brighter and it goes up to about a third of the way up the abdomen. But in the bilby bumblebee, which I've just said to Richard, we're going to make a special feature of for Norfolk Hofnod next week, because it'd be great if we could find some of these over the next few weeks. The bilby bumblebee, the red actually extends way over half of the abdomen. Absolutely stunning animal. Uh, so we think about both the extent and the uh, actual colour itself. And then with the bands, we look at position and also number, actually. So, for example, in the white-tailed bumblebee, I would describe that to you. If we caught one, I would say, well, it's got a white collar on the thorax, on the middle section. Sorry, a yellow collar even, not a white one. A yellow collar. And then it's got a yellow, second yellow band sort of just above halfway up the abdomen and a white tail. So all of these three have white tails with yellow bands. But this species, the garden bumblebee, it has three bands, one, two, three. One is a collar on the thorax. The second is also on the thorax at the back of the thorax. And the third yellow band is at the top of the abdomen. Don't worry about remembering these because we're going to go through them in each species in detail. But it's just to show you how we describe the banding when we're talking about ID. And then this is a cuckoo bumblebee. And this also has a white tail. It actually has a little black tip to its tail. And it also has two yellow bands. Again, it's got a yellow collar. But the second yellow band is notched and it's just above the tail. OK, so that's the sort of differences that we, we learn about as we get into ID in species. <clears throat> Faces, as I've already said, can be useful in separating males from females. So if it has a clearly yellow moustache like this little chap, you've got a male. If it's black, then you need to be looking at other features because but four males of the common species um, and all the females um, have predominantly black faces. So I can see these two are both females though because of their antennae. And we also, in one or two particular cases, in one common species, we look at face shape, and that's in this species, the garden bumblebee, where the face is very, very horsey, <clears throat> very long, and we use that to distinguish it from a similar species, which I will come to. So hair colour and shape. And legs, we've already said, if they're carrying pollen, then it's definitely female. If they're not, it could be either. Oops, I always does that. And just a little bit of diagrammatic detail, again, female social bumblebee, lovely hairless hind um, female there. And in the male bumblebees and the female, female and male cuckoos, that's all you need to know at this stage, the legs are more spindly and they're hairy on that surface, that hind leg surface. So hairy, spindly even hairier and spindlier in the cuckoos and in the female socials you've got the corbicular 
which you can see in the field, if they're in a pot, you can actually hold it up to the sun to get it to sort of glint at you. And the antennae, again, there's a close up. And you can actually see the segments there, Richard was talking about these long, uh, so the first segment is at the bottom there. And then you count these two little ones here and then the um, flagella segments here, which uh, make up the bulk of the antennae. And behaviour again, it's just, just recapping. Oh, my photos haven't come up, there we are. So queens often fly nests rummaging in undergrowth like this one. Workers busy, busy, busy. And males hanging out here. These are cuckoo bee males. Uh, you'll very, very rarely ever see females in a group on a flower like that. They, they just don't like it. And sometimes if you get um, a worker or a queen on a flower, if another bumblebee comes in, she'll raise her middle leg and it's a warning and you can actually get her to do that. If you just gently um, put your finger near her so she can see, she'll raise her leg and this, this, you know, this flower's mine, but you don't get that so much with the males. They're much happier to share. Hmm. So our eight common species then. <clears throat> so I've taken this from the Bumblebee, I, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust ID sheets. These are their diagrammatic representations of bumblebees. I do have a couple of issues with some of these, which I will point out as we go along, but generally they're pretty good to help you along. The Bumblebee Conservation Trust um, puts all the white tails in um, a group, uh, which I've put here on the left, so two pairs here. There is another white tail that they, they distinguish, but I actually pop that one in, in with the gingers, which I'll come to in a minute. So bear with me on that. So, first of all, the first pair are white tails and two yellow stripes. And all we're going to talk about today are the queens. Next week, we're going to do the males and the workers as well. But this morning, just the queen. So just look at the um, big pictures on the left. And we've got the buff tail bumblebee, Bombus terrestris. And the first thing my husband said, he doesn't know anything about bees when he saw this, well, that's not a white tail. <laughs> and he's right, it's not. Um, it's a buff tail. And that's where she gets her name. So it isn't pure white, it's an off white um, and can actually be quite almost you know, sort of beigey brown in some uh, individuals. But she goes in this column with the white tailed bumblebee whose tail is all, always snowy white. Her stripes tend to be more lemony, and the buff tailed stripes tend to be more marmalade y, a bit richer in colour. And then we've got a pair of species who both have, so we're just going to look at the queens white tails, white tail with one, two, three yellow stripes. So both of these species have two yellow stripes on the thorax and one at the top of the abdomen. So it almost looks like a belt across the middle. And I'll explain how we uh, tell these two apart in a minute, but it's this is the one that basically has the horse face. So the garden bumblebee, Bombus autorum, has a long, much longer face than the heath bumblebee. There are other clues as well. The heath bumblebee is smaller. She's more fluffy and she tends to be associated, as you'd expect, with heathland habitats. Another great one to look out for in the uplands of North Wales. They love heather. Okay. But in your gardens and on more lowland areas, uh, it's the, the garden bumblebee is by far more widespread and common than the heath. And then we pass on to the red-tailed um, pair, if you like, of species, the early bumblebee and the red-tailed bumblebee. 
And in the early bumblebee, this is this is a diagram which I think is slightly misleading because in the early bumblebee, that that tail tip is really so um, sort of inconspicuous in the field. It's more of a peachy tip right at the end, whereas the red tail bumblebee has this beautiful, stunning, more more expansive red tail. And the early bumblebee queen has two lovely bright yellow stripes. She's so beautiful. Uh, and she is the one that is smaller. This is a small species in comparison to all of the others. So there is an element of size there. Um, and then what I'm calling the gingery pear, the tree bumblebee is extremely distinctive with a, a tawny chestnuty thorax, which is beautiful, black, on the abdomen and then a snowy, snowy white tail. Okay, always a snowy white tail, although sometimes it can be a little bit indistinct if you've got quite small individual, but there are always white hairs there. The common card, this is another one of probably my least favorite diagrammatic representation. It is an all ginger bee, but the females especially can appear a lot darker than this on the abdomen but it never has a white tail like the tree bumblebee does. But these two can appear similar in the field, okay? So photographically, which is you know, obviously truer, those common eight queens, these are all queens that I'm presenting you with here. So firstly, the buff tail and the white tail queen exactly the same pattern, but the colours are different. The buff tail um, always appears darker in the field than the white tail does. The queen never has a snowy white tail, like the bombus Lepore and the white tail bumblebee. It's always buff. And like I said earlier, these the colour of the bands vary on the buff tail, but they're generally richer and darker. Than, excuse me, than they are on the white tail where they're more lemony. And certainly for me, I get loads of buff tails in my garden and see loads of queens emerging in the spring. Um, I don't see many white tail queens in my garden at all. I tend to see them again up on the uplands where I see uh, the Bilberry bumblebee and the Heath bumblebee, but that's not to say you won't see them. They are pretty widespread. And then we shall move on to the um, two red tail species. So the red tail bumblebee with her stunning red tail and all black body and the queen. There are two, there's a cuckoo and a rare species that looks similar to this, which I will touch upon next week. And the early bumblebee queens, I, I really like. So they're very, very attractive little bees. Um, and I, as you can see, the red tail is, is really just a tip. And sometimes it can look a bit like a buff tail, if the buff tail tail is quite dark, but early bumblebee queens are um, smaller than buff tail queens and they're, they're brighter. And then the garden bumblebee, um, not showing its white tail there, but it does have a snowy white tail. And you can see that it's three stripes look like two stripes there, but if, if you look above, the second stripe on the, on the buff tail is lower down the abdomen. So we've got here one yellow stripe at the top of the abdomen, meeting a yellow stripe on the thorax to form a belt and a collar. So three stripes. And this species, the heath bumblebee, also has three stripes, one, two, three, much more distinct in that image, um, but it's the face that distinguishes these two um, as the main factor. The garden bumblebee with a long horsey face, very long tongue in this species, and the heath bumblebee has much more of a heart-shaped face. So it's about as wide as it's long, but in the garden bumblebee the face is much longer than it is wide. And there's a, there's a, there is a habitat distinction there, so they might overlap as well. And then the last two, 
the common card around the tree bumblebee. I hope you can see why I've kind of put them together. I do get beginners mixing these up sometimes uh, because they can appear quite similar, but the tree bumblebee is showing off its nice white tail there, which is lacking in the common card. Okay, so those are our big eight species and um, those are our queens which kind of set the gold standard for them. And we'll have a quick quiz before we um, stop. So you can either jump in and have a go at this picture. Which queen is this out of the common eight? But you can also use the ID sort of diagrams and to eliminate. So look at tail color first. If it is, uh, white go to the right white with yellow stripes i should say if it is red you're going bottom left and then if we're looking at gingeriness we will go top left so if you can identify this by checking tail color and then the number of stripes which i can't see the chat for some reason um so can you let me know if anyone's putting their answers in the chat as I to which species that. Which you don't have to, you can do it in your head, but if you feel brave to put, put it on the line and have a go. Um, I don't know why I can't see the chat, it's very strange. Nope, can't see it. Getting a consensus for early. Yeah, I'll just give them one more. Oh, ah, chat, there it is. Uh, still can't see it. Yeah, so it is. It's it's early. Yeah, well done. So early bumblebee queen. Uh, very very distinctive and uh, very attractive uh, smaller species. I you think you'll find. Buff tail. Yeah, do you know what? If you put buff tail, loads of people do that, and I totally, totally, totally can see why, because. I've said that buff tail, if you look at that picture, that looks like that colour. You're absolutely right. But in the field, this species, it would be easier because you'd see that it was smaller. And when you get used to seeing buff tails, they're bigger and that tail is like a creamy off white rather than that sort of orangey red. But that is a really common mistake to make from a picture. So uh, yeah, don't don't worry about that. And then this one, I'll give you sort of thirty seconds or so. Which one do you think that is from from your head or from the diagrams? And it is a boy. <coughs> oh, it's gone down the wrong way. Excuse me. <coughs> what have we got, Richard? For that one. Lots of common carders coming in. Lots of common carders, well, yeah, it is. I mean, you know, straight away, you can see that is a ginger bumble. So you can go up to the left corner. And the tail, you could interpret as being a bit white, but you haven't got that black on the abdomen in the specimen. So, yeah, common carder queen. That's quite a distinctive one. Oh, this one's easy. I'm just going to give you five seconds or so. Um, in terms of the, it's easy in terms of the common eight. And it is, if you see this pattern, this coloration, it is pretty likely to be. Um, Richard, I'll leave you to answer that yeah, one. Right. Everyone's saying red tail. Red tail bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius, correct. And we'll touch on the. Uh, similarities with the rarer ones next week. What about this one? So go go to tail colour first. So that'll give you the which side of the page and then count the bands and look at the position. How, lots, of how, white, lots of white tails coming in. Yeah, 
Yeah. Somebody somebody said white tail but would like to see the face. Yeah, good one. Good one. And that that that's why ideas and photographs can be a right pain. Because if you can't see every feature, sometimes you just can't do it. Um, but you're, this is a white tail, and I'm confident of that because it only has one, two yellow bands. And the position of the band is indicative of a white tail, not a true bumblebee. But, but you're absolutely right. Being able to see the face could be helpful, but without those central yellow bands, it can only be one of these two. And the tail is snowy white, so it's a white tail queen. But yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah, there we go. I think this is a video. There we go. Oh, it's not, not working very well. Hang on, let me try that again. It's pixel. Oh. Um, I'll try again. If it doesn't work, I will leave it. No, it's not working. Let's just go to this one. Now, this is a terrible photograph, really. But can you have a stab at that one? Well, what, what, what's, uh, we got a consensus, Richard? We have, it was slow to start, so I think people were giving it a good scrutiny there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Everyone's coming in as buff-tailed. Yeah, that's good. And it needed scrutiny. And I'm fairly confident it's a buff tail. I didn't take this picture, but I'm fairly confident it's a buff tail because just from experience, and if you, you're experienced recorders, you'll know what I mean by the jizz. You know, the look of the of the insect, um, everything about it says buff tail to me, but, and the color of the bands, they're quite, they're actually quite a dark marmalade yellow, which you don't tend to get in the other species. But actually, you know, if we were being really pedantic, which, which verifiers are, we might say, well, we can't see the tail of that bee. And there's a one, two yellow stripes. And actually the early bumblebee, if you can't see the tail, it has the same stripe positioning as does the white tail. But everything about that to me, including the depth of colored stripes suggests buff tail, but you need to be wary. And that's when using your ID resources comes in handy. And I next week I'll go into more detail on all of the different ways we can get the best chance of an ID. And then this is another video which I will try for you. Is, is that working, Richard? Okay. Uh, good enough, I think. Just about good enough. Let's do it again. Quite a distinctive bee, so ho hopefully that's good enough for you to identify it. Uh, and yeah, pop it in the chat if you feel feel the urge, or just uh, say it to yourself. Yeah, I think everybody's happy that that's a tree bumblebee by the looks of it. All beans. Yeah, that's brilliant. Nice distinctive one. Everyone doing okay? Oh, it's a baby. Okay, so Richard's already touched on this, so um, we're going to do it next week. So I'm going to whiz through this. But yeah, we need data, folks. And these courses we're delivering, you know, we're not saying, oh my goodness, we, we expect you now to go out and record data because, you know, everybody has to find their own level. But we hope we can support you enough if you're not a recorder already to um, start even if it's just even if you just get confident with one or two species like the tree bumblebee and the red tails and just record them that would be brilliant so everyone can kind of do these things at their own level and if it's just in your garden that's brilliant you know you don't have to go out for recorder days and all of those things um, but if you do that, that that's 
fantastic. And I, I've got a lot of capacity in my project to work with Richard and North, lots of you in North Wales to build up these skills because the Bumblebee Conservation Trust has done hardly any work in North Wales to date. We've done years worth of work down along the south, the M4 corridor. And this year I'm trying to work with everyone, but the next two years I really want to focus on mid and North Wales. So, um, you know, let, let, let's improve our data in those geographical areas. And the way that we can help you to become part of that uh, is several ways. And one is setting up a bee walk monitoring transect, which we're going to be doing a training session on at the end of June. Richard, we can email everyone about that, can't we? Um, so, you know, lots more information on that. You can submit individual sightings as Richard has gone through and we'll go through next week with more detail. Um, oh, don't worry about the last one. I'm not worrying about that today. But um, certainly the Bee Walk Monitoring Transect and the individual sightings, we are going to really focus on supporting you to do that, even if you're a beginner. Right, and uh, I can't resist a bit of homework because I used to be a teacher. And so the first two, particularly, do uh, check out the Bumblebee Conservation Trust website because there's loads and loads of stuff on there. And you can um, look back on some of the stuff I've told you. And we also have a YouTube channel with recorded stuff on that uh, you can go to from the website. But the key one that I'd love you to do, and this has worked well with the other groups I've been working with, is to take a photograph of a bumblebee and with your identification. And you can do this at whatever confidence level you feel comfortable with. So if you're a complete beginner, you might just be happy to know that it is a bumblebee or that it's a male or a female by looking at the antennae and whether or not it's carrying pollen um, or have a go at species. Doesn't matter if you're wrong or it doesn't matter, you know, if you're quite competent and you want and you find something really interesting like a cuckoo, Richard's already sent me some cuckoo photographs from North Wales. So I'll be including those next week. And then next week, I'll put the photographs into the presentation. I won't put your names by them. We'll just have a look at some North Wales bumblebees and see what we find and see if we get a consensus on the ID, etc. So do that. But when you send it, please label your email to me, cough nod, because otherwise I'm going to mix it up with all my other courses that I'm doing. So please put just cough nod on somewhere in the email to help me. I won't be able to identify, I won't be able to respond to you all individually, but I will try and put everyone's pictures in the presentation so that you get some feedback. Um, and if you get a chance, have a look at the Lurk Wales app on your smartphone or your tablet, but don't worry too much about that this week uh, if you're not yet registered, because we'll do a bit more on that next week. And um, 